All right. I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker, Leah Giorgini. Um, Leah is a British Indonesian immigrant who moved from England to the United States in 2016. As a psychiatric survivor, domestic violence survivor, former foster youth, and a person who has previously experienced homelessness, Leah is working towards a world free of oppression and injustice. She believes that promoting psychological and social approaches to psychosis is equity in action towards this vision. Trained as an occupational therapist, Leah primarily worked in clinical mental health settings until she came to the United States, where she found a home working in nonprofit leadership. Leah has worked in an array of settings with people diagnosed with psychosis, including working in early intervention in psychosis, assertive outreach, a mental health recovery cafe, a high secure forensic hospital, and homeless emergency shelters. She currently serves as executive director of the U.S. chapter of the International Society for Psychological and Social Approaches to Psychosis. In Leah's presentation titled, I'm Not Invisible, Envisioning Right-Centered Care, she will present her story and outline how connecting the dots of trauma, intersectionality, and occupation can lead to rights-based care that helps people feel seen and empowered. Leah, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for being present and you can now go ahead and share your screen. Thank you so much for the introduction. Yes, let me share my screen. And I have to be a bit fancy today and just share a portion of my screen because usually when I give presentations, I have my multiple monitors set up, but I'm actually um, in Finland right now for a conference. So I've just got my, um, my one monitor. So I think we're there. Can you see my presentation okay? Great, okay, let's begin. Um, I, I'm so excited and so honored to be here. Um, it's wonderful to be invited to uh, a stage this big. Uh, I see a wonderful attendance we have today. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope by sharing my story and a little bit more about human rights that we can critically appraise our work and think about ways that we can do even better and align our work to our values. So as was mentioned, uh, I am a British Indonesian woman and of as of 2022, also an American citizen. I moved to the US in 2016 and I call Indiana my home, but I temporarily live in Italy uh, for my husband's work. We're here for another year. And I'm currently zooming in from Finland for the international ISPS conference. Um, I'm in occupational therapy. My bachelor's degree is from the University of Southampton. And my master's degree is from a Swedish university, uh, Jönköping. I also have lived experience, as was mentioned, uh, and spent five years working in early intervention and psychosis in the UK. So all these experiences have given me this really global view of health and insights into the different ways in which psychosis is treated and conceptualized across different borders and cultures. Uh, I now have the pleasure of being the executive director of ISPS US, and we have a 70 year history of promoting and advocating for humane, holistic and rights aligned mental health across the world. Uh, so I think I'm in the right place today. I think I'm with my people. This is a little overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So we will define human rights aligned healthcare. I'll present my study as a young person with psychosis uh, as a case story. We'll examine psychological distress within a societal context. And I know you just had a presentation with Dr. Shim that looked a little bit at that too. And we'll discover some examples of rights aligned mental health care from across the world. So what are human rights? I wanted to discuss the role of human rights in early intervention for psychosis. So let's start by understanding what they are. They are the fundamental freedoms that everybody should have, including those of us who use and provide services. These rights ensure that we're all treated with the fairness, respect, equality, and dignity that we all deserve. And importantly in our work, they also guarantee that people have a say in their lives and can participate fully in decisions about their care. 
The responsibility to uphold these rights lies with the state, but also with health and social care providers. Now, human rights are universal. Every single person is born with these rights, irrespective of who they are, where they come from, or any other characteristic. And while there can be legal restrictions that limit how we exercise those rights, there are many in mental health care, these rights are inherent and they cannot be taken away. And this universality is crucial in our work as it reinforces the idea that every individual we support deserves those fundamental protections. So when we think of human rights, this is probably what comes to mind. It's the UN Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights. It was adopted in 1948 and is a foundational document that outlines the fundamental rights and freedoms for which all people are entitled. It sets the global standard and ensures rights like the right to life, liberty and security, freedom from torture and degrading treatment, and the right to health and well-being. So you can tell by those examples uh, that these uh, are very pertinent in the context of mental health care. Like Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or any other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Not all of those things are readily available in the US, I think you'd probably agree. It demands not just access to mental health services, but equitable, high quality care that respects diverse needs and promotes holistic well-being. And that should be free from Article 5, torture and inhumane treatment. Now, I'm sure none of us go into our roles thinking we're going to torture people or provide inhumane treatment. But sometimes the systems that we're in or the cultures of work that we're in can make upholding these human rights more difficult. Another fundamental right here I think is really important is um, uh, the importance of social inclusion. Uh, for, and people experiencing mental health conditions can be very readily uh, excluded from society. So by embracing these rights, uh, these principles into our care, we can promote radical shifts towards systems that prioritize respect, autonomy, and the inherent worth of every individual. And fostering these environments uh, in our workplace is how we can ensure that people in our community and people we serve thrive. Now this convention may be less familiar to you. I'm sure some of you um, know it, um, but it may be less familiar for you because it's not been ratified in the US, but I still think it's something we really need to focus on. And it's the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, CRPD. So it was adopted in 2006, and it's a landmark treaty that recognizes the inherent dignity and equal rights of people with disabilities, including those with mental health conditions. It asserts that disability results between the interaction between the actual condition, but also the barriers in society. Therefore, it emphasizes the importance of removing those barriers to ensure full and effective participation in all aspects of life. So in the context of mental health, the CRPD is particularly significant as it challenges the historical marginal marginalization and discrimination of people with mental health conditions. For example, Article 12 recognizes the rights to legal capacity on an equal basis with others. So that advocates for supported decision-making over guardianship and involuntary treatments. So that means we really need to empower individuals we work with to make their own choices about their treatment, respecting their autonomy and their agency. Uh, Article 19 affirms the right to live independently and be included in the community, promoting community-based supports over institutionalization. So it supports the transition from the medical model of care to a social model that prioritizes um, self-determination and inclusion. The US did play a role in drafting and negotiating the um, CRPD, but it 
still hasn't been ratified despite um, bipartisan support for disability rights. Um, it's my belief that ratifying it would strengthen uh, the protection for disabled people within our country. Uh, and I encourage you to look at advocacy opportunities to get this to happen. Now, you know, I've gone through a lot of different articles and it's all kind of technical and there's so many different things to remember. So it would be fair to say there's probably somewhat of a knowledge deficit around the intricacies of human rights legislations. So the freedom model is something that was actually made in the UK um, to help simplify the values uh, and avoid avoiding needing to have that kind of technical knowledge. So you'll see it stands here for fairness, respect, equality, dignity, and autonomy. I mean, obviously in mental health care, fairness would mean equal access to care, ensuring that decisions are made impartially. Respect means acknowledging and valuing each person, listening to people, honoring their preferences. Equality meaning we treat people from all backgrounds the same, eliminating biases and discrimination. Um, Dignity is upholding people's worth with compassion, making sure people feel valued, uh, autonomy, making sure that people can make informed decisions and empowering people to take an active role in, in their treatment rather than being having things done to them. So, I mean, look up this paper if you're interested in finding out more. We don't have time to go in depth today. But I think these principles in general can give us um, kind of that, that high high overview of the way that we need to operate, but also that our services and our systems need to operate. And so very often that's the thing that's missing. Now, I don't need to tell you all that the mental health field is pretty littered with clear historical violations of human rights. I'm not gonna give a thorough history, but I think it's worth touching upon this so that we recognize um, that even then, people thought they were doing what is best. They thought that what they were doing was best practice. But as our knowledge has continued to grow, um, we see that wasn't the case. So what are people in our field gonna say a hundred years from now about our work? Are they gonna say that everything we're doing is humane? Or will they look back and look at some things that are happening and say, I can't believe that happened. What were people doing? So, you know, throughout history, the U.S., I mean, not just the U.S., across the world, we've we've grappled with these significant violations, um, reflecting systemic neglect, discrimination, and abuse within the mental health system. And it's not just historical, it's still happening. The most egregious example, of course, is the mass institutionalization of people in the 19th and 20th century, where people come confined to really awful uh, asylums and subject to inhumane living conditions uh, and deprived of their basic rights and freedoms. But like even now in recent decades, the criminalization of mental illness has resulted in a disproportionate incarceration of people, exposing them to further trauma and inadequate treatment in the criminal justice system. That's not to say to my friends work in the criminal justice system, you're doing a bad job, of course not. But we can all agree that jail and prisons are not the optimal place for someone to heal. So with these historic um, human rights violations in our minds, it underscores this urgent need to reform and renew our commitment to upholding people's rights. Now I'm an occupational therapist as, as Jen said, so it would be kind of remiss of me not to talk a little bit about my profession's history and role and turning the tide against some of these inhumane practices. So OT as a profession, um, shout out if you're an OT who's here, uh, was formed as part of the moral treatment movement. And moral treatment emerged as a revolutionary approach to mental health care in, in the late 18th and 19th century, and was a radical departure on what had been happening at the time. It was rooted in humanitarian principles in the age of enlightenment, and it emphasized um, the need for humane and compassionate treatment of people with mental illness. It sought to provide a therapeutic environment that promoted socialization, meaningful activity, moral instruction, and believed that these elements could facilitate recovery and rehabilitation, not just containment. 
It was inspired by reformist movements led by people like um, Philippe Pinel in France and William Tuck in, in England, who advocated for the rights and dignity of people um, diagnosed with mental illness. In the United States, moral treatment was significantly advanced by a clinician called Dr. Benjamin Rush. He was a physician and he viewed um, madness as a physical disease rather than like a moral failing, um, you know, which had some uh, moral benefits, not all moral. So his approach aimed at kind of understanding and addressing the common underlying pathological process of the disease. And he, he elevated hospital standards and, and emphasized humane treatment, but his focus on the physical also led to some less than humane practices. So we'll see here, this is his tranquilizing chair. The device was aimed to control the blood flow of the head and to reduce motor activity because he believed that these things called brain inflammation, which would then would lead to madness. He also advocated for bloodletting and purging as treatment. So, you know, we can certainly see from this picture that doesn't look too moral to me, tying people to a chair. If we just wanted people to keep still, why are the straps holding them down, right? It's pretty clear that's not moral. But at the time, this was part of moral treatment. So what are we going to do in the future that's going to be like this, where people see, obviously, this is not the way we want to treat people. So by examining the past and examining the present, we can try and prevent these mistakes happening in the future and really genuinely support the well-being of people that we serve. So just some hypothetical questions for you here. How do the founding principles of early intervention, this movement, align with human rights aligned practices? And how could early intervention be criticized according to human rights principles? Now, for me, I, like I said, I spent five years working in early intervention and it was the best job I'll ever have. I loved it incredibly. But there were times where I felt we could be doing things better. And some of it depended on who I was working with, which clinicians. So, of course, we're all in this work because we want to prevent people's lives from being derailed by serious mental illnesses, as they're, as they're termed. We want to work with their families. We want to empower them. We have a lot of things going in this field that mean we are human rights aligned. But early intervention could be criticized for, you know, maybe thrusting diagnoses on people earlier. Some teams, I know not all. Or promoting medication as a first line treatment. When we know it has pretty serious physical side effects. Um, not that I'm anti-medication, but these are some of the criticisms that could come up about early intervention work. And that's certainly what I, I hear now working um, uh, in, in the US and speaking to other practitioners, um, there's some skepticism about the work that we do. Um, and I think we can critically look at ourselves and see how we could do better. Now, I, I said I'd share my story because I, I mentioned to you all that um, as, a, as a teenager, I had an episode of psychosis. Now, I want to just start that off by saying my story is not the ultimate example of human rights violations or even the most extreme case of florid psychosis. But it's my story, so it's the only one that I can really share with you. And I, I hope by personalizing one person's journey through the system, that it could chart a path for others, but also show you that even in not the most extreme ways, things that people do with the best intentions could actually violate some of these rights. So this was me as a teenager, um, looking kind of grumpy and intense. I grew up in the leafy suburbs of the home counties outside of London with my mom and my stepdad, who was a professor. My mom was a first generation Indonesian immigrant and she'd previously worked in Indonesian politics, but when she came to the UK, those things don't um, don't cross over, so she was a hairdresser. Um, my biological dad visited me occasionally, but we weren't close, and um, he really obviously favoured my older sister, which strained our relationship. 
When I was about seven years old, my parents divorced and I moved in with my mom and her new partner who was abusive. My mom got cancer, bowel cancer, and the physical violence escalated, including incidents where he slashed her with a knife, fractured her skull. So we were in and out of domestic violence shelters and I saw a whole lot of things that a seven-year-old should not be seen. Eventually, because I wasn't safe, um, I was removed from her care and I entered familial care and then foster care. I spent a year with a cousin. I went through three different foster care placements. So the core issue for me was that my, um, my mother's partner made really credible threats against my life, uh, saying that I will kill Leah if you try to leave me, Herney, that's my mother's name. Um, eventually, I was reunited with my mother after she left him mostly. And I became her carer because she was still very sick with cancer and she died when I was 12. So after my mum's death, I live with my sister and my stepdad. And um, I guess no surprise, I ended up entering the mental health system at 15 because I was struggling to come to terms with what happened to my mum, the trauma that I experienced and the continuing difficulties in my family. Um, these things don't just fix themselves. And I started in child and adolescent mental health services in the UK and then transferred to adult mental health team when I was 18. The peak of my difficulties was between the ages of about 16 and 19. It mostly was, it started with depression and anxiety, uh, but I was so depressed and anxious, I struggled to even leave the house and I had to drop out of college twice. So that's a picture of me as a teenager. I wasn't just a mental health diagnosis. I was also intelligent, kind of a smart ass. I was into punk rock, as you can probably tell. I wanted to be a music or political journalist. I was the valedictorian equivalent in my high school. I was a school president, um, the president of the board of the school. I was sarcastic. I was silly. I was interested in politics and current affairs. I was a deep thinker. But I suffered a lot with anxiety related to my performance, perfectionism, and um, feelings that I may be abandoned. Um, which is obviously understandable given my foster care history. But despite of everything and all that intensity, all the adults and my peers around me expected great things of me. The ghost of my Asian mother was above me and expected me to be a lawyer or a doctor. I know, my, I know my Asian friends are here and uh, probably uh, understanding what that's like. Um, and I like to think that, that I did get there in the end. Like, I think I'm doing pretty well now, but falling off that cliff of, cliff of anxiety into psychosis nearly derailed everything uh, and very nearly consumed me. If I pinpoint the tipping point, it was this one day where I attempted to go to college but I couldn't remember my way to class. It was the weirdest feeling, like nothing felt real. I couldn't recognize the hallways. I couldn't recognize people's faces. And like, this wasn't a new class. Like I'd been there many times before, dozens and dozens of times. And I was really afraid. Um, another student came up to me in the hallway and they must have noticed how terrible I looked because they asked me if I was okay and if I needed help. Um, I remember mumbling something about, oh no, I've, I've got the flu, I need to go home. There was no way I could navigate myself to class or be present enough to understand the, the lesson. But I was also afraid to go home because I believe my biological dad and my sister would kill me or somehow control me to kill myself. Can't explain exactly how it didn't even make sense to me then, but it, I felt this quite strongly. And I started to eventually piece together random bits of evidence um, and convinced myself that they were conspiring against me. And I felt just unsafe all the time. I started doing inexplicable things like running out the house in the middle of the night and, and hiding in a graveyard that was near my house. Um, and one day my boyfriend at the time called the police who sent a helicopter out to find me because he thought I walked into the sea. I'm, I'm from a seaside town. So at um, 17, I was involuntarily committed to an adult hospital. There weren't any adolescent beds. And I remember being driven up this long winding path to the grand doors of this 
British Victorian style asylum, huge red brick ornate building and it was bathed in moonlight. And I remember that the Red Hot Chili Peppers under the bridge was playing on the radio. But it was then, you know, waking up in, in a hospital dorm uh, where I realized I'd hit rock bottom. The, it was awful, this ward. Like my hospital bed had a had a curtain around it, but it was broken. So I couldn't even get dressed in dignity. Um, I only had the clothes I was wearing. They didn't give me any spare clothes. And I felt like my blood was battery acid, I felt agitated and toxic. I had nothing to do there but watch TV. There was no meaningful therapy or healing, but I was contained. I couldn't kill myself. There were people watching me. And it was while I was there that a doctor prescribed me uh, antipsychotics for my agitation and paranoia. Now, have any of you ever taken antipsychotics? Because it's kind of hard for me to describe what it feels like if you haven't. I almost want to suggest, and please don't actually do this, but I kind of wish that everybody working this field would take it for a few months to understand what it's really like. Because you have no idea. I was so tired, really, really tired. I'd sleep for 16 hours a day. And my mind, which used to be sharp and active, became slowed and dulled. I gained masses of weight and I felt like I was living in this twilight world of sub-reality. But it was clear to me that everybody around me was happy I was taking medicine, my family, my care team. But it felt to me like nobody cared about my experience of medication. Nobody really cared about my future anymore or who I was, um, who I wanted to be. I felt like I was in that, in a chemical equivalent of that restraining chair that we saw in a previous picture. I'd see my care coordinator every couple of weeks. Uh, I'd see my psychiatrist every month uh, and they'd run through a list of symptoms. Was I hearing voices? Was I paranoid about my family? Were people inserting thoughts into my mind? But nobody asked me about the emotional impact of the side effects of the medication. Nobody asked me what I needed to start living my life again. Nobody asked me what my dreams were. It was like I was a patient and that was my identity now. I was a professional mental patient and I was to exist in, in this financially and socially non-contributing underclass and nothing more. So my family eventually sought help outside of, mental, of my mental health team, my NHS mental health team, when I told them I desperately needed a different type of therapy. I, I wanted to be well, but I, could, I, I couldn't find the pathway forward. It was then that I connected to um, a psychodynamic therapist called Sandy, who I really credit with saving my life. Now, much of the therapy that I'd received before was CBT-based um, with pretty junior clinicians which for me, and I know it helps a lot of people, but for me felt very unhelpful. For me, the approach that was given made me, made me feel like my experiences were being erased and it made me feel invisible. So what do I mean by that? For example, when discussing my paranoia about my family, I was encouraged to look at all the evidence that showed that they cared for me and they weren't wanting to kill me. I mean, I already had some ambivalence about the belief at that time, but this treatment did nothing to examine, uh, to heal my, my wound inside me or the fear in me. It just made me feel like I was discredited, as though it was like my problem. I had the broken brain. I was the one thinking wrong. And it made me feel like my trauma was erased. Um, it's trauma that had like very logically led me to feel like the world was unsafe. But Sandy didn't do that. Sandy saw me as a whole human being. Uh, she understood my trauma and, and how logical that was. Um, she empathized with the, the danger that I was in and the danger my mother was in. And I felt really emotionally nurtured. And because I felt emotionally nurtured, I felt able to emotionally nurture myself, my inner self, my inner child. And more than that, more than just seeing me, uh, you know, as a traumatized person, Sandy saw me within the context of the larger society, of the things around me. 
So this helped me see myself and my experiences through a societal lens. For instance, when we were working with my tendency to self-harm when I was dissociated because I, I thought my body wasn't real, she gave me this little yellow book that you see on the screen, Women in Self-Harm. And this book was pretty life-changing for me. I, I realized that I was angry. I was furious, but all the anger was turned inwards. Uh, and you'll see from this quote that um, women are taught to manage other people's feelings at the expense of their own. Anger is being deemed unfeminine, uh, and yet is one of the most powerful responses to trauma. It's a reasonable response to unreasonable events. So in a distorted way to injure oneself could be seen as being morally superior to injuring others, no matter how injurious those others may have been towards us. So by directing that anger um, towards our inwards, towards ourselves, we protect others from the full fury that we have. Now, that, that I think that's first of the introduction, but just reading that, I was like, yes, that is it. I can't show anger because anger has been dangerous in my life. People who get angry hurt people. So I was doing things to harm myself. Um, I mean, it's not just that either. It's not just the gender thing, because my story is interwoven with social injustices through my intersectionality. I carry that legacy of surviving childhood domestic violence while a white man was beating my small Asian mother, while I was being socialized within my household to align with whiteness. And I experienced this cultural clash of stiff upper lip English combined with the breast beating, howling to the moon, Asian expression of, of uh, emotion. And additionally, there's the interge intergenerational trauma of the colonization of Indonesia, which profoundly shaped my family's history and, and how my mother behaved and acted towards me. So my grandfather was a freedom fighter against the Dutch colonizers. So all these layers of injustice, intersectionality, all contributed to the complexities of my mental health journey. And I needed to see that to move forward. It was like a domino effect of understanding how much my trauma was rooted in societal forces beyond my immediate environment. And it illuminated to me how much mental illness, both my own and that of others, is rooted in social ills rather than just biological issues of the brain. Everything fell into place. It wasn't a fault with me or just a fault with me. It wasn't a fault of my family or my relationships. It wasn't the fault of my school, my social worker, my mental health team. I was being seen in this, in this whole context. And there were these bigger social problems that caused all of these things to happen. And they were the ultimate source of the problem. So according to the treatment I received up to that point, I was seen as defective. I had a chemical imbalance. I was a mental patient, I was a foster kid, I was abused and neglected. The burden of addressing that trauma was then placed on me. The focus was put on me for fixing my brain rather than addressing all the social injustices that caused or uh, empowered these forces um, to, to harm me. Through viewing my lens like this, I became a passive recipient of treatment which erased my sense of self, led me to be invisible. By upholding human rights, we look outwards. So despite the good intentions of the clinicians around me, the overstretched, underfunded mental health system led me to be on this conveyor belt of care. Next patient, next patient, next patient. Racism, racism affected my personal history, my mother's abuse. I'm sure how I was later treated in hospitals. The biomedical dominance of the mental health system reduced my, uh, my life to the broken brain narrative and left me hopeless about having a better life. Uh, sexism was pretty evident from the gender-based violence I've already mentioned. This, this stigma, which can come across in low expectations of people around me, but also the, the self-stigma that I felt. Like people with psychosis, didn't leave full lives. People with psychosis couldn't live by themselves. Um, so it, le it leads to what Patrick Corrigan, a researcher in Chicago, calls the Y-Tri effect, 
it influenced me and how I thought I was going to live. Then the ableism and capitalism suggested that my lack of productivity made me less and consigned me to society's margins. So the social ecological model of um, mental health and wellness, I know this is small, so we'll, we'll share this with you later, um, but it highlights the need for a broader approach to what we term mental health and mental illness. So traditionally, even in great innovative, innovative services, like the one I worked in, we still primarily saw a role as dealing with the individual and maybe the relationships, family therapy, um, you know, working with people in their schools, for instance, um, providing psychoeducation perhaps to um, the community. But if we stop and don't look at the bigger picture, we neglect these important other things in policy and society that are forming a tidal wave, exerting pressure down on families and individuals that are overwhelming them and harming them and also preventing us from supporting them in the ways that we want to help them. So I believe that every practitioner, every service provider should also be an advocate. We need to be standing up in these outer levels and using our knowledge and our case studies, our lives to influence that policy around us. Now, I don't know who of you here is familiar with this model. Like uh, my education was, um, European, of course, and I'm an OT. Um, so forgive me if this is a common model used, but this is the, the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, which is developed by the World Health Organization in 2001. So through this model, we can see that the broader community and societal factors not just influence the, the incidence rate of psychosis, but also how individuals experiencing these issues are able to function and participate in their lives. Um, so unlike traditional biomedical models that focus just on pathology, it helps us to give us a framework of understanding the multiple dimensions of functioning and the contextual factors. So there's um, two parts here that I mean the health condition, um, of course, would be psychosis in this, in this example. Bodily structures to the left and functions might be the kind of um, cognitive or perceptual issues that we see in psychosis. But then here are two really important aspects. For OT, but not just for OT, for everybody. For me, as a patient, these were neglected. So activities. Activity would be the, the task that you do in your life. Um, it would be... Um, learning, working, self-care, living independently. And there's also participation to the right. And that's like our roles we have, like uh, being a worker, being a mother, um, uh, engaging in, in the aspects of community life. And then below it, you'll see like the environmental barriers, which, which we've discussed, these outer barriers, and maybe also personal factors like gender or, or sex or um age and, and health behavior. So the reason I bring up this model is that to me, it aligns really well with human rights principles because it recognizes that health and disability are not just medical issues, but they're influenced from the outside. And that actually by focusing, focusing on occupation and participation, we focus on, um, on boosting people's uh, human rights. Let me explain that a bit better. So, in OT, we have a concept that occupation, the things that we do, our roles, uh, are the doing, it's what we do. There are being, there, there are becoming, and there are belonging. Doing, being, becoming, and belonging. It shows us that it isn't necessarily the voices that stop you from participating. It's the environment around us that doesn't acknowledge this kind of neurodiversity. It shows us that if we can find ways to change the way we do our tasks, the way that we can engage in society, that then disability would be lessened. And to me, it wasn't, at least um, you know, after the first crisis period, it wasn't the symptoms that were stopping me from, from having a full life. It was the inability to do the things I wanted to do. 
So if we refer back to the UN conventions on the rights of people with disabilities, um, if we if we reduce our focus to just that biomedical model, it violates that concept of accepting differences in the human condition. And that was part of it, accepting differences. Um, it denies accessibility, accessibility, it denies equality of opportunity, and all of those things are essential for full participation and inclusion in society. So you can see having an occupational focus is rights aligned. Uh, this model here um, is the Canadian model of client-centered enablement. And I don't think this model is just useful for OTs either because it shows us the various enablement skills that can guide us in supporting our clients effectively. I can't go over it in detail, but um, you'll see here the different headings. So adapting, modifying the task or activities to better fit a client's needs. So it could be adjusting the client's working or living conditions to reduce stress and functioning, advocating, acting on behalf of clients to secure resources, services, or rights. So maybe we need to stand up and advocate for access to housing, for, for um, more comprehensive mental health services. We should be collaborating with people around us. We should be consulting with people around us, um, providing information to people, to policymakers about different treatment options and potential outcomes. We should be designing and building these systems that en enhance a client's ability to participate in their lives. Uh, and we need to hold this specialist knowledge um, uh, and, and share it with the world. So I'll move on to the next thing. So yeah, all of this is to say, this can have, having this wider impact that looks at occupation can really profoundly impact a person's identity. So this is, like how it worked for me before I was unwell. I was seen as an achiever. I was a promising individual. I was an intelligent go-getter. I was seen as mature and responsible. All these things made me made people think that I was gonna have a bright future. But me during um, my crisis, uh, my identity was dramatically altered. I was labeled as sick and dangerous. I was viewed as not capable, a failure, a dropout, college dropout, patient. I was a difficult patient because I argued and wanted different things to things that I was being offered. But me after having moved beyond just being a patient, having moved beyond being a traumatized person, me understanding myself in context made me a survivor. I'm now an expert in my own experience. I'm a professional, accomplished, strong woman. And I'm a change maker. I'm a change maker. I'm here to make change through my work at ISPS US, through being here today, and just through my daily interactions with people. I'm not currently doing clinical work, but when I was, I was, for the people that were up for it and wanted to do it, I was encouraging them to take steps themselves to take change. Because that's so empowering when we feel we're going to make a better future for not just ourselves, but for other people. So I just wanna wrap up with a couple examples of best practices, because I know when we talk about these things, it's a lot of, well, you're not doing things right and this is bad and that is bad, but there is lots of good examples of incredible practice that's happening in the US and across the world. So if you haven't seen this WHO document, uh, the guidance on community mental health services, promoting person-centered and rights-based approaches, I highly recommend you go to the WHO website and download it now because it's a treasure trove of examples and really clear guidance on what it is we need to do to change things. They really acknowledge that this entrenched over-reliance on the biomedical model in which most of our work is on diagnosis, medication and symptom reduction limits our understanding of the full range of social determinants that impact people's mental health. And that is what leads us to hindering, uh, to hindering a process towards the human rights approach. It's gonna take a, a while for us to get there, but I think if we can start modeling it in our one-to-one -one interactions with people, we can start creating cultures of, um, in, our, in our workplaces, in our teams, 
And if we start doing a little bit of advocacy and stepping out the box and trying to change bigger pictures, that we can we can do it. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and we can take that single step today. So let's look at a couple of different um, models here. Some of these you may have heard already. I, I, I know these are talked about, but we'll mention it today for people who haven't. So this is Soteria House. Um, the one on the top left is in Switzerland, and the one on, on the bottom um, is in Vermont. So we'll talk about the one in Vermont. It's in Chittenden County, but there's also uh, Soterias across the world, like Israel, UK, you know, everywhere. The scope is a supported living service for individuals experiencing oppressive psychosis, and there are only five bedrooms, but people can stay there for three to six months or longer. It's voluntary residential care. There's a, a home-like environment, and um, and psychotic use is de-emphasized. Uh, people are encouraged to have personal power. They're supported with decision making. There are non-coercive practices. It's non-hierarchical. And the staff is not just professionals, but also peers and residents. Now, the short-term outcomes are similar to hospitalization. But, you know, the long-term outcomes, like in five years, are far better. People have less symptoms, they re-hospitalize less, and they um, function better, and they have greater levels of employment. And more than that, it costs less. So a daily cost of treatment at Soteria House in Vermont in, in 2020 was $547. That's a fifth of what it costs for a day in a psychiatric hospital. So why aren't these things everywhere? There's a little video that we, I oh know, I will play this one. I'll play this one because I think it's a nice one. We opened Pathways Vermont Soteria House to provide an alternative place for folks who are experiencing mental health distress or crisis to provide an alternative space for that experience. It's a home-like setting where people can come and explore that experience that is important and meaningful and come to terms for themselves what that's going to mean for their lives. Soteria comes from the ancient Greek word, meaning safety or salvation, deliverance. In present day terms, we use Soteria to mean a community setting to support people who are experiencing what some people call the first break psychosis. Soteria House is building a new paradigm for mental health services. We are creating community and we're changing the story about what mental health distress has to look like. It's a safe place, a comfortable place, and a place where you can explore with others what your experiences are. People may feel like they're going it alone, and it, it can be different. You can come here, you can be with others, and you know what, you're, you're not so different. People come from unique contexts and backgrounds, but we process in similar ways, and. Intense life experiences can be extremely liberating to face and to be curious about, and they don't have to be so scary. Okay, I'm gonna stop it there just for time. The second um, service I wanna highlight, we won't go into in detail, because of time, I wanna leave time for questions, is Open Dialogue uh, in Finland, where I am right now, the home of Open Dialogue. So um, it's for individuals in mental health crisis and has been largely used for individuals with first episode. And it includes the entire family and support network. They meet at people's homes in the office. They um, avoid over reliance on medication. They emphasize uh, self determination. Uh, the impact is huge. It's five year recovery rate 82% did not have residual psychotic symptoms, and 86% had, had returned to studies or a full time job. And it has universally um, positive results. Um, they're a team of the, the, the one that's mentioned in the in the WHO document, and they're a team of 60 nurses who provide continuous individualized support. Um, and they're really trying to prevent the hospitalization by supporting people in their community. They uh, have different principles like um, offering immediate help, having a full social network perspective, flexibility, mobility, responsibility, continuity, and, and a tolerance of uncertainty, and fundamentally dialogue. 
So they bring people together, the, the client and also family and, and service users to um, everyone to discuss around the table what it, it why that was bringing them there today and how they want to move forward. And through that mutual dialogue coming to a, um, a shared pathway forward, or maybe not coming to a pathway forward, but tolerating that until we can find ways forward. So there's a video there that um, you know you could look at another time. So I'll, I'll send this out to you. Oh, let me just pause that. So I just want to you know um, say to wrap this kind of up a little bit is that this journey of a mental health care, uh, looking at mental health care, should lead us to this profound realization that healing is a deeply human endeavor. And by embracing principles rooted in human rights, autonomy, dignity, and well-being, looking at initiatives like satiria and open dialogue, we are illuminating this pathway forward where compassion, community, and understanding guide us towards healing and recovery. So I, I really do believe that together we can build a future where empathy reigns and that the promise of healing is, is in reach for everybody. Now, if you'd like to continue this conversation with me, um, I invite you to check out my organization and our website, ISPS US. Uh, as I said, we're 70 years in now of, of promoting and advocating for these types of treatments. And there are 21 US, IS, US, ISPS chapters across the world, um, many of whom are here with me for this conference in Finland. The US chapter offers education, advocacy opportunities and membership. Uh, we have an annual conference, which will be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and hybrid online. We have an academic journal, an ISPS book series, uh, and advocacy opportunities. So this weekend, some of our members are in Washington, D.C. at a Hill Day. Our uh, membership is open to everyone, service providers, people with lived experience, the family members. Um, so check out our website. My email is there. Reach out to me. I, I look forward to continuing uh, this chat with you all. My goodness, Leah, that was incredible. I want to thank you so much for your presentation. I'm, I, we've got some questions. I, I wanted to just first start by saying that um, throughout your chat, um, folks really were impacted by your story. So just know that you've got many responses that really validated your experience and, again, noted how powerful it was to hear your story. One, I liked one in particular, says, Leah, your experience is valid and you are so absolutely seen and heard. I like that powerful thank you all right well we have a couple questions i'd like to start with this one it says how do we advocate for clients who experience similar symptoms as you've had that you've shared especially when we work in a treatment team that has a different perspective than the person receiving services a different perspective to the person receiving services and they want something else in the team want them to to have that's how i how i read that yes I think when, when there's any kind of um, disagreement about treatment options, um, that first of all, it's important to find out the commonalities. Mm -hmm. So what is in common between what the client wants and what the team wants? I also think it's important to have conversations internally as a team to understand why is there a difference? So is there a difference because this is, this is just the, the, the treatment as normal? Or is there a disagreement because we believe that that person's perception of reality is impacting um, maybe their best interests? Um, or is it because what they want can't be offered by our system? I think pinpointing that can be, can be really useful. But I think emphasizing the commonality and coming to um, having dialogue and um, having some compromise can be good. But I, I am of the belief that our care should be client-led. And my, my best experiences of working in, in early psychosis is that we start with what the client wants. And there might be nothing to do with mental health treatment. It might be, I don't, I don't know how possible it is for your service, but for me working, it might be, I want a burger. So I take them to Burger King or I take them to McDonald's. We'd sit down and we'd have food or I don't want to live with my parents anymore. They're driving me up the wall. Okay, let's look at uh, independent housing or ways to lead to independent housing and work on that first. 
Because if you're going in with more coercive treatments or things that they don't believe they need, um, if they don't trust, believe that you're out there in the best interest, that's not going to help. Um, but we have to do the work internally with our teams too to raise awareness about different ways of working with people, that things that may not seem therapeutic are therapeutic, and that things that we believe are therapeutic might actually be harmful at times. Um, and that can be difficult if you're a junior clinician, but I really believe if we keep keep going on about it, keep sharing examples of best practice, keep sharing that people across the world are doing things differently, that we can eventually influence our service delivery. And eventually we will be the ones leading services. We will be the ones in politics. We will be the ones deciding what a Medi Medicare will pay for. But we have to keep elevating ourselves upwards to make that influence. That's well, really well said. Folks really responded to that in the comments as well. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. We had um, another question. I think we have time for a couple more. It, it noted related to the slide about OT enable, enablement skills. The question was, was that form specifically for folks then with the living with psychosis um, patient, patients and clients, or was that, again, other, for some, some more other, more generalized? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a general model for particularly for, um, well, I particularly used it in mental health care, but it's a universal um it's universal for any type of condition. So, uh, you know, I'll send out those slides and you can learn a bit more about it. Um, but I, I love the Canadian model of occupational therapy. It really not just looks at the ways that we need to interact one to one with our clients, but looks at the uh, our responsibility as clinicians to do more and to influence society. Oh, excellent. That's wonderful. Another question that we received was, what role have the police and the legal system played in impacting the human rights of disabled people from seeking help for their conditions? Like, well, I think that question is asked because the person knows what role that has had, right? I'll give you an example. I was, um, not long after I moved to the US, I had another crisis, not psychotic, but I had a mental health crisis. Um, my well-meaning uh, family member called the police and uh, police came in and held me in a full point hold and the um ambulance people who were there injected me with uh oh. with um a fast acting tranquilizer which caused me caused me to hallucinate and then be traumatized by hallucinations do i ever want to call the police again do I, will i allow someone to call the police on me again no I was held down by four police officers injected against my will and the symptoms they gave me from that injection were a lot worse than what I was experiencing. What I needed was someone to say, Leo, what's wrong? And, oh yes, you're justified for feeling that way. How can I help? Now that's not to say all police officers are bad. Like when I worked in domestic violence field, we had some wonderful police officers who were trauma informed, um, who really cared about people, who really had skills to talk to people. But not all police officers are skilled to talk to people. And when, you know, you're in fear of, um, you're afraid of receiving mental health treatment because of the harm that's going to be done to you, it pushes you further out to the margins of society. I imagine there are many people who are unhoused right now who may be, may be open to mental health treatment if they hadn't previously been scarred and traumatized by the mental health treatment they had received. So I'm not saying there is no place for police. There are times when it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, in my role in early intervention, I had someone come at me with a, with a sword. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the life was in danger. We needed um, that kind of support to protect myself and protect uh, members of the public. But that's a lot rarer than the actual incidents of police being called out. That is rarely the case. And in the US, the police are armed. And we know how that plays out in a lot of situations, mm -hmm. that they're able to use a more lethal amount of force because they they have it. Whereas, um, you know, in the UK, that was less of a, a concern. No, thank you. And um, yes, it's you're spot on, spot on. We have one one more. Just just we ended on the note of solidarity with Dr. Shim. What is your advice for someone newly starting anti-oppressive work? What do you think? Or like kind of how we could all work together to make this someone better. who's just starting in this line of work, you, you said? Yes. Yep. Anti-oppressive work. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I would say welcome. And you have so much power. Mm. We all have so much power that we don't know. And the best thing about our power is that we can share it and that we can bring out the power in other people. So I would say that's my main message is that, you know, not really that long ago, I was powerless and now I'm powerful. And it's not because the system has given me the power. It's because I've taken the power mm -hmm. and I've empowered myself. And I had people, I had Sandy, I had, you know, friends around me, my partner at the time, um, who've helped me build my power. So I think if we mutually harness our collective power, that we can make a lot of change because it can feel hopeless when you're battling against a system day by day as the patient or, you know, as the, as the junior clinician who can't really change anything. But if we work together, we can do it, you know, and organizations like mine, like ISPS US, we, we come together collectively, spaces like this, we come together collectively and we, we have to commit, we have to commit to doing one thing each day and ramping it up, doing more and more. And then we'll reach that critical momentum where radical change happens. Oh my gosh. Well, that was a beautiful ending. Thank you so much, Leah. That was that was a powerful presentation. And I, I really appreciate how you, you brought that all together for us, especially your, your final speaker of the day. And you just drove all of these ideas home for us. So I want to just thank you for, for that. So again, thank you for being here. We really You're welcome. appreciate you. You're great.